The following podcast is a proud member of the Blue Collar Roots Network. Find all the shows by visiting bluecollarroots.com. Here's the president and primary owner of True Tech Tools, licensed engineer, and the nicest BS artist you will ever meet, Bill Spohn. Welcome to another edition of the Building HVAC Science Podcast. Today's episode, we're going to speak with Joe Coonan. He's from Clear Result. Clear Result is a program implementer, a program consultant for utility-based energy programs. Joe's going to talk a lot about how programs really can benefit and provide opportunity, business opportunity, real opportunity for contractors, as well as technology implementers, technology manufacturers. But of course, we're talking to contractors, and he's got an awful lot to say, which I think will be quite illuminating for contractors who listen in. Hopefully, you enjoy this podcast, and we'll also have some information in the show notes, following up on some of the kind of funny, unique, and special things that Joe talks about in today's episode. So listen up. How are you doing, Joe? I'm doing great, Bill. How are you? Good, good. We've worked together probably from some of the early days of BPI, I want to say 2000 or so. Yeah, maybe a little bit later than that, maybe in 2006, 7. I think that's when I met you. It was at one of our BPI standards discussions. That's it. The committee meeting. I sort of remember you sitting there. I think at that time it was an overhead projector. <laughs> yeah, right. I believe it was propane powered, as a matter of fact. That's right. <laughs> so, Joe, you hail from Little Rock, Arkansas. So, how did a guy get involved? You work now for Clear Result Consulting? Yeah, we're not consulting anymore. We're just Clear Result Inc. What do you do at Clear Result and what does Clear Result do? Clear Result is a utility program implementation firm. Clear Result was founded by Jim Simmel and Gene Garland, who are no longer with the business. Gene has passed and Jim has retired, but they started the business back in around the early 2000s. They had personal histories in utility efficiency program implementation, and so they wanted to start their own company and do it their way. Back in those days, at the time they were doing that, I was a home performance contractor in Arkansas where there were no programs or anything, but I was just out here in the frontier doing it. And they landed a job with Entergy Arkansas as our state public service commission decided to roll out efficiency programs. And Gene started coming to meetings there and met some fellows from Entergy. And one thing led to another. So uh, he wound up securing a job with Entergy as a contractor to help roll out the efficiency programs. And at that point, they needed to find staff in Arkansas, and they came across me, and I joined the company back in 2007. I was employee number 23 at the time. And since then, Clear Result has aggressively grown by acquisition and merger and other approaches. And we're now, I think we're the largest exclusive implementation contractor not only in America, but in the world. And that means there's competitors of ours that do this type of work and do a lot of it, but that's not their only thing. They'll do a lot of other type consulting. Some of it's government contract consulting and this and that. But Clear Results exclusive utility efficiency program implementation firm. And we are the largest one. I think we're in over 40 states. We have about 2,800 employees roughly. So when I say I'm number 23, people kind of do like you did. They kind of roll their eyes and go, it's come a long way since then, and it's so energy efficiency and the marketplace and everything. So that's the short version. So what's the typical utility program look like? I mean, what are sort of their goals and any of the major things that would affect contractors that are involved? I'm glad you asked that, Bill. <laughs> I'm not actually maybe the best person to answer it because I have a limited vision of it from my local and regional aspect, but I would say the overarching, these programs have been around in certain parts of the country much longer than my experience goes back, especially in the East and West Coast, New England, California, and even the Pacific Northwest and some of those areas, even Florida, have done efficiency programs for decades. Since we're talking to contractors, I'll give you the short answer first, which is, why do utilities do this? And the answer would be because they have to, (laughs) because their regulatory body, the commission, utilities board or public service commission or whatever it's called in these particular states, have determined that 
don't just come to us for a rate hike because you had an ice storm or you think you got to build a new power plant. You're going to also have to show some proactive engagement with the marketplace to help your customers improve the efficiency of the way that they use energy. And in turn, what that will do is it will minimize the need to continue to expand and build new generation capacity. It will go farther on a tank of, of fuel, so to speak. That's pretty smart, actually, because they're attacking both ends of it, supply and demand. And I've seen a lot of different graphs in my day from the Department of Energy. There's one that it sort of shows the economic growth that America's had since the 1970s versus the energy growth. Looking back, it's been amazing the change that we've made in efficiency. When you think of back 20 or 30 years ago, everybody had incandescent light bulbs and the hottest thing going was a T12 fluorescent, which was way better than incandescent, but that's nothing compared to the LEDs we're putting in now. And you look at the amount of growth and construction, new housing and commercial and all kinds of infrastructure building and everything. So it is working. And what that means is it always puts a business opportunity out there in the marketplace for somebody who wants to step up with either technology from the manufacturing and distribution side. If you want to invent a new LED light fixture that's better than sliced bread and better than your competitors and reliable, the market's open for that. If you're a contractor and you're willing to step up and help implement some of this stuff, the door is open for that. And the door is open for those who are willing to change because it is about being different. It's about going the extra mile and about serving your customers and figuring out how to make that a part of your business model, which is the biggest part of being a successful trade ally in any of these programs is figuring out how you need to change to take advantage of that opportunity. I know you've done a lot of training of contractors, both you personally, and you've managed the rollout of different programs in different areas. What's that go like? I mean, what kind of contract are you looking for? What kind of contractors do you get? And how do you move them along that spectrum of change? You say I've done a lot of training. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I've tried to train a lot of people. <laughs> I don't know if the training is stuck or not. <laughs> Occasionally it does. You and I have done a lot of sessions, especially at ACI, when it was called that back in the day, Affordable Comfort Conference. And, you know, with the ResNet Conference and all that. And oddly enough, the people that seem to be most willing to change are the ones that have the least credentials in the industry, or they're the youngest or the smallest companies out there. And when you take what I've noticed that the 80-20 rule just loves this industry. It just pops up everywhere. We recruit, let's say, 100 contractors and, well, maybe 20 of them will actually do something for us this year in our program. And if you look at those 20, they're responsible for 80 or 90 percent of all the activity in our program. Then if you look at those particular 20, the 80-20 rule applies to them. 20 percent of that 20 is doing about 80 percent of that. It's crazy because you never know who it's going to be. You look at a company and you go, wow, here's somebody who's been around for a couple of generations. They got a big market share. They got a lot of customers. Boy, their customers could really benefit from this program. So I bet they'll be all over this. And it just doesn't shake out that way normally. It's like, no, my train's going down the track pretty well. Thank you very much. And what you're describing to me is like changing, upsetting my Apple cart and expecting things out of my technicians that they don't know how to do or they don't want to do. And it usually doesn't pan out very well going that route. And so somebody who's smaller and hungry and wants to grow their business and is able to be nimble from the business side and make some changes seems to do a lot better in these programs. It's a different way of doing business because the money that's available for the incentives or rebates or whatever you want to call them, it's there because you're going to do something more. You're going to do something above and beyond the norm. You're going to seal ducts when nobody's sealing ducts. You're going to tune up an air conditioner by cleaning all components, not just the condenser. You're going to verify that the charge is right digitally and accurately after the airflow is digitally and accurately assessed, not the same old way that everybody's doing, which is a tire kind of a tune-up. And that goes for anything else. I'm talking about AC mostly, but it goes for lighting and insulation and everything. So with that kind of reducing ratios that you talked about there, it sounds like you're finding something deep within the contractor and probably the owner of the business that they might not even know was there. This is, sounds really you know, esoteric here, but it, it really sounds kind of interesting now the way you put that is you're digging down deep and you're finding really unique people who want to take the chance, take the risk to do something unconventional. 
However, with all these years of work, wouldn't you say that the results are becoming more or less proven? The results for the utility as well as for the contractor themselves. Well, we've proved the, the fact that we're still open for business. We're evaluated every year and you've got to be a cost-effective program and you've got to achieve your goals or show that you're making progress every year towards those goals. If you're doing a lot of things right, then it gets a little bit easier each year that you do a program in a certain geographic region with a certain marketplace because now the customers start to hear about it and finally it starts getting a little traction. And when a customer wants it, then the contractors start to go, hmm, maybe I better be able to deliver this because they're asking me about it and I don't even know what they're talking about. So there's that aspect to it. Plus, if you're a pretty good program manager type person, if you understand the changes that need to take place within a business and you make adjustments to the way that you roll out your program and the way that you communicate with contractors. If you can do a better job of that, like if you walk a mile in their shoes, you'll do a better job of recruiting contractors into your business than if you've never tried it before. And paying attention to, well, what worked, what didn't work last year? Why are people opting to not participate at all or they're getting into the program but they're not doing anything what's behind that what's driving that if you don't ask those questions and dig down a little bit and get feedback from your trade ally base then it's going to be pretty ugly it's like anything else in life if you really are working it hard to succeed and you're analyzing what you're doing right and wrong and what the market wants and what the market's willing to do and you make adjustments to it then you ought to be able to get a little bit better at it but you better or it's not going to be around any longer because let me just put it this way. If we can go out there and tune up air conditioners and put in new efficient lighting and seal ducts and do those things to create freed up energy at a cost less than building a new power plant, we can keep our programs. And if we can't, they'll go away. So you better figure that out. And guess what? The avoided cost that the utility has for not generating that power is constantly going down in our region. Now, That may not be the case everywhere. In heavily populated areas like in the Northeast Seaboard area, New England and California, it may not be the case. We have fracking in the South and a lot of the Midwest, and that has brought a plentiful source of natural gas forward into the market that's not been there in the past. And so it changes the marketplace for the next 20 years for utility if they're going to go, well, let's build a peaking power plant and let's make it run on natural gas because there's plenty of it and it's cheap. So all of a sudden, it just got more challenging for your program to meet the metrics of being cost effective. So you better make an adjustment or your program is going to go away. And the program is required by the PUC, I guess the utility commission, whatever you call it in the state. You're required to meet certain metrics and there's cost effectiveness tests. There's about four primary ones. I won't go into the weeds too much on it, but basically when you look at your total recovery cost of a program, you throw in the incentive amounts, you throw in the admin amounts, you throw in the KW, the KWH savings, you throw in the technology cost. What does a customer have to spend with or without a rebate? Somebody has to spend a certain amount to achieve something. And if you can't make all that stuff work, then it'll fall below 1.0. And like, I've run this program that I'm running, which is an HVAC tune-up program now for 10 years. And we have fallen anywhere from 1.1 to 2.7 on the cost effectiveness scale. Well, the utility gets nervous when it's getting down toward one. They say, well, you better shoot for 1.4 minimum. And when it starts to dip, you have to go look at it and figure out how you can make it work better. And there's only a few ways you can do that. The technology cost has to come down or the incentive amount has to come down. Well, the incentive amount doesn't affect some of this stuff, but the benefit needs to go up. And so how do you make that happen in the marketplace? And the theory behind the incentives is they have to be just right, the Goldilocks effect. If they're too high, you're giving away money that you shouldn't in order to get something to happen. If they're too low, it won't be high enough to make a contractor change or make a customer see the benefit in it. And so they won't do it. You got to find that point right in there where you go, okay, I'm not going to spend any more than we have to, but it's going to be enough to change the market. I've met a lot of smart people that work for Clear Result, yourself included, and now I'm beginning to appreciate more. There's a lot of thought that goes into this. There's a lot of estimations, planning, data collection that goes into this. So it's kudos to you guys at Clear Result putting this all together. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it never stops. 
this year alone is you're familiar personally a little bit with this, what I call tune-up program is pushing the envelope as to what we can do with an existing air conditioner to milk more savings out of it, just running on a daily basis year after year, as opposed to getting no maintenance or getting very minimal market type maintenance. And then look at other things. Well, what else can we add? This year, we added a couple new measures. Did a pilot with a smart thermostats for small commercial. And there's some market sectors out there like schools, churches, places where people don't set their thermostats back to get the savings that are possible. And that's looking really good as a measure that can be done by the same contractor at the same time as a tune-up for the same customer and other things on the commercial side too. Maybe more efficient electric motors can be put in. And so looking at ways that you can add a cherry on top and some icing and would you like sprinkles with that now you're making it more attractive to the customer you're having additional measures that can help you in your savings a tune-up i get to claim for five years thermostat 15 years well if i get to claim the savings for 15 years well guess what i just helped my trc now it's going to be longer the savings are going to be there more persistent so there's a lot of that which you said a lot of analyzing and strategizing and tracking to figure out in advance instead of going Hey, what's that roaring sound? (laughs) Oh, it's Niagara Falls. Are you ready? Yeah. (laughs) I like your tagline for clear result. Do you want to go ahead and state that and maybe what your perspective is on that, on the tagline? We change the way people use energy? Yeah, that one. I think that pretty much says a lot about who we are and what we do. Companies kind of struggle sometimes to come up with a concise way to get the message across. Well, who are you and what this is about? We change the way people use energy is pretty much captured it, I think. And whoever in our company came up with that, I think did a great job because it encompasses it in a lot of different ways. That could be the consumer, contractors are involved, manufacturers are involved, utilities are involved. All of those are people using energy and It takes energy to make energy, it takes energy to move energy, and it takes energy to use energy. When you change the way people use energy, you're changing basically everything in that chain. And that affects a lot of different vocations, a lot of different industries. And if you learn how to do it and do it well, it can make a huge cumulative difference. The contractors that get engaged, are you still looking to recruit them in different areas of the country? Say a contractor listening to this says, This sounds interesting. I want to change the way I do things. I want to differentiate myself. How do they get involved? Or is it obvious? Do you guys reach out and find them? How does it happen? We always make an attempt to reach out in each individual marketplace where we work and say, okay, well, who are the movers and shakers? Who's in business? And how do we go about meeting them? Is it a trade association? Is it looking at the licensing authority and seeing who's on their list? Obviously, there's a lot of proactive work on our end to try and reach out. A lot of cases, we win a contract with a utility and they've had a program for years and maybe we were not their implementer in the past, but somebody was. And or maybe the marketplace has gotten used to, oh, yeah, ABC Power has this program and we've done business in it before. We've heard they have a lousy program. We heard they had a great program or whatever. So there's usually a little bit of history going on in most markets. What I've learned is that recruiting never ends, really, because the people who helped me reach our goal as trade allies in our program this year may not all be back next year. Things happen. Businesses take left turns and right turns. People die. The business closes. The kids don't do what mom and pop did. They don't want to do what mom and pop did for decades. They go in a different record uh, direction. You've got larger companies that want to grow, but not in the way that your program is shaped. So Don't count on not needing to recruit most of the time. There are a few exceptions to that where our program has been around for a while and they've got a group of trade allies that are doing great. And those trade allies have really figured out how to make it work for their business and they don't want to let go. And so they're the ones that show up every year and hit it over the fence. That's kind of a mature program. We have one of those in Arkansas as a home energy solutions program. They're actually rationing their incentives to their top eight to 10 performing trade allies. And people come up to me and go, hey, I want to get one of these blower doors and a duck blaster and get into that program. I just say, sorry, fella, you're about five or six years too late. It's fully subscribed. They've got overachieving trade allies that have been with the program for years. They're all rationed on how much business they can have in the program each year. And the only way for you to get in there is to go to work for one of them. 
that's where you want to get to kind of if you're in the driver's seat that I'm in is, hey, I want this to be easy. I want my program to run on automatic pilot. It doesn't ever do that completely, but I've always been the innovator guy. I've been out trying to change the world the hard way. And my program is still actively recruiting contractors every year to get into it by digital gauges. We call them gauges for short, but they're really refrigerant analyzers. Measure stuff in a better way and do things with those measurements instead of just making a measurement because you can and actually understand what the measurement is telling you and then leave a running HVAC system that was in place that's going to remain in place and not be replaced for years at a level that's anywhere from 10 to 30 percent higher efficiency, more BTU per hour capacity than it was when you got there and document it so that I can claim the savings so that I can pay you the money. And doing all of the above is kind of a big deal because you're dealing with an industry that has been taught that you got to run and gun. You got to hit X number of stops per day. Each tech is only going to bring in X amount each day for you. And you can't linger too long at one spot or you're just wasting time. And they look at their maintenance agreements and go, oh, yeah, we got to hit a thousand or two thousand customers this year we better get started hey why don't you take twice as long and do this for me and i'll pay you some money you know what nah, i'm good <laughs> so you're saying measure with a purpose that uh, encapsulates one of your comments back there and i think also a term you used before that i've heard you say is market transformation <laughs> how's that going kind of like frankenstein <laughs> <laughs> It's taking place in my program, not as quickly as I'd like to see it, but it is taking place. And with most utility programs, you can do a simple program. You can design and implement a simple program that's not too painful for people. They don't have to do a whole lot more stuff than they're already doing. They just need to document it for you so that you can claim the savings and pay them the money. And then there's ones that are a little bit more innovative. Maybe they're using a new technology or they're doing something like we're doing where it's like, I'm requiring you to clean the coil and the blower, not just the condenser. And I want you to measure before and after and verify airflow is within plus or minus 15% of 400 CFM per ton before you even try to check the charge. And then when you check the charge, I want you to do it properly to superheat and subcooling within three degrees on subcooling and five degrees on superheat measured digitally at the right place at the right time. Say what? Well, after you get a technician to do all of those things, You've done market transformation for that one person (laughs) if they come back the next day. And if you can get a company to see the value in doing that, and that company starts taking it to their customers and their customers can feel the difference in the comfort level in their house, the humidity control in their house. And if they can see the difference on their energy bill, then you're doing market transformation. Because guess what? That customer lives in a house. He's got neighbors. He works somewhere, he goes to work, let them go to church and belong to civic clubs, and word gets around. Good news travels fast, bad news travels fast. That's market transformation. I thought bad news traveled faster, is what I heard. Yeah. (laughs) Or as we say in clear result, good news fast, bad news faster. If something's going wrong, let me know it. Don't sit on it. So this is like a spillover effect where once the contractor gets it, they do work outside the program using these new techniques, procedures. I've seen personal evolution. I've seen business evolution to where technicians may not want to admit it to their boss, but they'll say, I hate doing this this way, but it's made me a better tech. I understand stuff that I've been faking for 20 years. (laughs) People come to our class a lot of time and go, well, I've got 20 years of experience doing this. Well, more than likely you got one year experience 20 times. So why don't you sit down and listen for a little while and we'll have this conversation (laughs) I don't want to badmouth everybody in a group, but people get handed a lot of shortcuts in life. And this is not your grandpa's tune up and it's not your grandpa's market and age. There weren't 13 and 14 and 18 seer equipment back then. The refrigerants were different. People's expectations were different. Energy costs were low. A lot of times there's a lot of science going on that technicians don't recognize in the systems that they're looking at they're trying to troubleshoot something we actually make them better at recognizing what the system is telling you about how it's running and what these numbers really mean and pinpointing a bad txv or pinpointing uh, maybe some non-condensables in the system or figuring out why am i only able to get two and a half or three tons out of a five ton unit what's missing here what am i missing and then you can start looking at the numbers and go ah 
well, it's either the airflow or why is my delta enthalpy between the total amount of heat in the air between return and supply? Why isn't that difference greater? Why is it so small? And teach them how to go backwards, reverse engineer to what the root cause is on that. And that's not something that a lot of demand has been placed on the technician to do in the past. It's get in, get out, it's blowing cold air, flick your bick, you got good airflow and go on to the next one. That's called market transformation. And what we find when we go down that road is that somebody will pay attention and listen and come in with an open mind and see how this can help them do a better job. Listen, you know what? You're going to cut your callbacks substantially. You may be thinking, I got to get in and get out because I got to make a hundred bucks an hour. And if I dilly dally, I'm not going to do it. Well, if you have to go back to 10% of those within the next day to the next week because customers still not happy, or you're getting blamed for something that you could have fixed on the front end, and you didn't really fix the problem because you didn't really find the problem. You just make it work a little bit better. Well, guess what? That's profit. Not going back is a great profit opportunity for a lot of companies. And if you can make your technician serious enough about it to go, hey, before I pack up and get in the truck and close the ticket, I'm going to look at these certain things. And then if there's anything weird about it, then I'm going to talk to the customer about doing a little extra work. So we've got contractors who have entered our program and said, yeah, I'll buy your toolkit. I'll do your heavy lifting, Joe. And then they figure out, wow, this is missing piece and go out and offer it to their customer base and their customers spread the word for them and they bring them referrals and the contractors wind up making new customers. I've got one contractor who put it in writing for us and we're about to send it out again in this year's recruiting letter as a quote that his replacement air conditioner business increased by 75% in one year because of the new customers that he made through the Cool Saver program that we operate, that he participated in for Entergy Arkansas. Everybody seems to be going after that shiny object. Yeah, I don't sell a replacement. You know, that's where the money is. Okay. Well, guess what? How about doing a really good job for a customer who needs a replacement? It's been really kind of putting it off and kind of forestalling it because they don't really believe they're going to get the big benefit from it and they don't trust anybody to do it right and Maybe they think it costs too much for what you get. And then somebody comes in and says, you know what? I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make your old system work 25% better. And you're going to feel it. You're going to see it in your energy bill. And all of a sudden they go, you're the kind of guy I like to do business with. I know I've got an old system here. I've been talking to a lot of different people through the years about replacing it. Why don't you tell me what you can do for me? Boom. What's that worth? What's not going back to, I don't know, 5, 10, 15% of your customers because your technician missed something the first time. What's that worth to you? Not only in the dollars for not having to go back, but think about the impact on your reputation from having to go back, not getting it right the first time. And what's the negative market transformation comments that are going on between the neighbors and the coworkers about your company because of that? Somebody will step back and take a look at it and go, yeah, I think all those benefits are substantial enough. And I get training through the utility by the implementer to do this and do it right. So I'm making a better technician. Well, guess what? If you make a better technician and you cut down on callbacks, you just got more technicians. And that's what everybody's telling me that they don't have enough of. I don't have enough technicians to do my business already. Why would I want to do more work? I don't need more customers. Well, what you need is you need technicians to do a better job of seeing what's really happening with these systems and getting it right the first time and not going back and building a customer base like the one I just told you about who wants you to come and do a change up for them because now they trust you because you know what you're doing. Exactly. There's a training element to it. There's a tooling element to it. Why don't you talk a little bit about kind of the tools that are required to do this? Is it anything like that's way out there or can you deal with some of the, the more basic tools maybe contractors already have themselves? You know, we've been transforming the industry from analog to digital now for well over 10 years, maybe 15. We started going down that road. Everybody had analog gauges. Most people now have digital. We were one of the first programs to require digital technology on the gauges. A refrigerant analyzer that calculates superheat and subcooling based on the type of refrigerant. And, of course, the model that we were using back in 2008 and 2009 was about $2,600 just for the refrigerant analyzer. And that did not include 
well, it's about 1500 for that one, but the whole toolkit was about 2600 because it had a vein anemometer. It had a static pressure test kit and a manometer for that, and the hoses and the probes that go with it, and a video scope to inspect the coil and all that stuff. So we decided if we're going to expect people to walk away from a system and it's going to have the correct airflow, it's going to have the right refrigerant charge, it's going to be verified, then we're going to need something that's more accurate to verify that stuff with. We look at the digital units that we went to in the beginning of this program were 10 times more accurate than an analog gauge that was freshly calibrated by the manufacturer. So that's a huge leap. And not only that, it calculates superheat and subcooling to the 10th of a degree on its own without you using a slide ruler interpreting, interpolating in between measurements and all that stuff. So there's a big leap forward right there in achieving, if you're going to say, we're going to go to the market, we're going to achieve a 10 or a 20% increase in performance. Well, measuring is critical to prove that. And because we're going to fund that with ratepayer funds that are supporting these programs, we've got to prove it. So that's kind of the thinking behind the transformation that we did in the beginning of this program. It's like everything else. After a few years, the technology actually gets better and the cost comes down. When I think back about what I paid for my first cell phone, what I paid for my first computer for our household versus what you can get now, people say it all the time. It's so true. You got more technology in your pocket on your cell phone than they put the guy on the moon with on Apollo. <laughs> I watched a show on PBS about the Voyager, and one of the scientists was saying, yeah, you know, when we put this thing together, you get more technology in your pocket than what we had to send this thing out there. He and I, I'm not talking about your cell phone. I'm talking about your garage door opener. Jeez. <laughs> 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 you know, well, kudos for you guys. You're even better than I thought. That's the way it is. And so nowadays, you know, it's still to tool up with a high quality, dependable, toolkit to do what we need to do, you're still going to drop 1700 to 2000 bucks. You're going to have your airflow measurement devices. You're going to have your, not only your digital analyzer, but today's generation of it, Bluetooth to a base unit to your iPad or your phone. And we have developed an app that guides you through the process. And when you finish, it's a paperless tune-up. You hit submit and we got it in our database without you writing anything down on a piece of paper, without you entering it into a computer later. And we've gone through all those phases. We went from paper and pencil to typing it into a computer and uploading it to us. To now it's just an app and you hit, you when you're done, you're done. But you get a review screen first to decide if you're ready to let go of it. <laughs> and if there's a red flag or a yellow flag, you have a chance to correct it. Well, you're still on the job. In the old days when it was paper and hand entered, we didn't know it was bad until you sent it to us. Well, by the time we got it, you're long gone. If you're going to go back and correct it, now it's another trip. Now you can fix it before you leave. That decreases the cost for the contractor and increases the viability of the program as well. What kind of measures are you employing? Do you do duct sealing? Is that in all programs or does that change from program to program. Of course, you do the tune-up, the airflow, refrigerant charge, cleaning, maintenance, that kind of thing. The basic tune-up program that I run that we've started here is uh, clean the condenser, clean the coil, clean the evaporator as good as you can in place. Now, if you got a really bad evaporator and there's no way to clean it without cutting it out, that's a unique situation. You can still do that if you want to, but we can't pay you more for doing it, so you're going to have to charge a customer for that. So in most cases, it's clean it in place. Now, the blower has to be removed, disassembled, clean, reassembled, put back in and rewired. So you've got those cleaning aspects to do. People always go, well, you know, it's not dirty enough to clean. I'm going, clean it. <laughs> We've had contractors say, we started in this program and you made us clean blowers that we would normally, we'd run our finger over and go, eh, it's not too bad. We're not going to clean today. But because you made us, we measured before and we pulled it out and we cleaned it and put it back. So we're seeing a 10 to 12% increase in airflow from cleaning blowers that we thought were relatively clean. And then you add the coil to that. Well, by the time you can see dirt on the fins, what do you think's going on down in between there? Just because the surface of the fins don't look too bad, it doesn't mean that stuff's not building up. It only takes like a hundredth of an inch to impact the heat transfer on those fins down in there by a significant amount. I'm talking about 10, 15% difference in heat transfer. So yeah, it's the last thing people want to do. So guess what? Most of them need it. So there's the cleaning. 
The next thing is, and let's verify that airflow is within the ballpark because a lot of airflow is on these blowers, the speed setting is set at the factory and it's never changed. Or you've got a furnace or an air handler that can handle anywhere from, oh, let's say from a uh, two to a three and a half ton. Well, chances are if you put it on a two ton, it's probably got too high of an airflow. If you put it on a three and a half, it might be too low, but you need to measure it because the airflow actually is going to depend upon the coil configuration, how clean the blower and the coil are, the size of the return, the type of filter being used in the duct system on the return and supply side. So what are the chances? It just happened to be right without you checking it. Well, nobody likes to measure CFM, but we make them do that too. And it's normally done with static pressure, sometimes the vein anemometer is returned. And we find airflow correction is needed in over 25% of the cases. Now, if you get it clean, you got good heat transfer going on. You've got the blower working as efficiently to move foot pounds of air that it can. And then if you get the airflow correct, now you're ready to correct the charge, which is usually the first thing that people try to do without doing any of the above. Now the charge, if Bubba corrected the charge where you got there and you did all this cleaning and airspeed correction, you think the charge is going to need to be changed? Well, you're damn right. It's going to need to be high or low. And so now you're balancing the whole thing out. And that's what makes the dog hunt right there. When you do it all, there's only three things you can do to make an air conditioner perform better. Let's get it clean, get your airflow right, get your charge right. And it needs to be done in that order. And when you do it in that order, you get the results. It's not rocket science. It's going back to the root to the basics of this industry about that's the ideal. That's what you should be doing when you go out there. That's why we call it a program. We can pay you money for it. Nobody's doing it. How unique is measuring and verifying? Was that something that seems to me like you guys were really the first ones to promote that? You guys mean Clear Result were the first to promote that? It's obviously more common in commercial work and testing and balancing. And it is a requirement in some jobs on the commercial side to the mechanical engineer requires a certain amount of testing and verification, commissioning in of a system. On a residential, not so much. And from what I've seen, it's not even really that important whether you meet code or not. Just somebody says you did. Measuring and verifying correctly, that's an art and a science. There's a lot to it because it not only measures and not only depends on what you're measuring it with and the accuracy thereof and the parameters of it, but where you take your measurement. You can take it in the wrong place. You take a great measurement in the wrong place, and guess what? It's a lousy measurement. You can be too far away from the coil, too close to the coil, getting your temperature to get your enthalpy, getting your airflow right. Your static can be taken in places where there's turbulence. So there's an art to taking a good technical measurement in the right place, the right way. That's part of the training that we have to go through. People aren't born knowing that. No. I've seen is like a surge or an increase in the, the number of people who are interested in this, contractors interested in it. I think one of the things is the podcast we're doing right now, the HVC School podcast, the HVC School blogs, their tech tips, that kind of thing. If if you're not tuned into that, I'll send you a link, but I'll put that in the show notes. The HVC School is doing a lot of what you're talking about, taking people from things that they should know, but may have never learned or may have forgotten and, and making sure they do put them in order and, and do them correctly. So I think it looks very hopeful, very bright <laughs> for the future for HVAC. Things are really, I think they're getting better. Well, I hope you're right about that because we're going through a transition where a lot of the old timers are retiring or they're like me, their knees are getting bad. And they, just, they can't do it anymore. They've been at it for 30 or 40 years and it's like, okay, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to go sack groceries at Walmart or something. I don't, I just anything but this. I don't want that weekend watch anymore. But if the industry is going to survive, there's new blood coming in. There's younger fellows are, they are coming in. This is uh, kind of an interesting industry and it's an interesting time in our industry because for the last several decades, it's been kind of upside down in my opinion, meaning a lot of times some people who wind up going to the technical colleges that we used to call Botex were the ones that they weren't quite there yet to get to college, you know, or they didn't have the study skills or the math understanding. So they go to technical college and then we put them in charge of understanding electricity and pressures and amps and boats and ohms and all this stuff. And I don't know, we need some of the best people. We need some of the best minds out there doing this stuff. And it is a very technical and scientific field. It's very interesting. Guys who like to tinker, mess with cars, mess with gizmos of all kinds is very attractive to them. That's, I think, should be a prerequisite. 
But what I see missing a lot is people go through those courses and they come out and they've mastered the book learning and they've passed and they got a diploma, but they hadn't had their face put in it and they hadn't been in the trenches in the mud. And so if we could catch them at that point and go, now, come with me. <laughs> I want to show you how to use the state of the art digital tools and understand what these measurements mean and use an app to determine the outcome of what you've done for this system, right or wrong, and then how to look at that information and make a judgment call as to, are we done yet? That's it. You summed it right up. And that's what we preach, you know, to trade allies who want to get into our system going like, what is your strategy to deal with the fact that there's a technician shortage and you're suffering from it and you think it's bad now? <laughs> Just hang around because do you have a strategy? Hope is not a strategy. Newsflash. If you're expecting me driving to work one day and you see a guy standing on the street with a piece of cardboard that says, I'm the greatest tech on earth and I want to go to work for you, that's not a strategy. Let me tell you what a strategy is. A strategy would be like embracing this program and the technology we bring and looking at doing it right the first time and using this diagnostics and all these wonderful tools, measuring devices, and education that we have available to us today. Doing that job right, doing it quickly, doing it right the first time as far as diagnosing the problem, fixing the problem, building customers' confidence, improving your success rate, not going back and having callbacks and upset customers. And now to that, build your farm team internally by taking folks who like the idea of having a career in this industry, who've been through some of these basics at the two-year colleges and who are ready to go out now and tag along and take a program like this if you've got one available to you you're lucky and if so embrace it and go get some customers where you have a lot of work to do in one place like schools or multifamily or something you can park the truck there and not drive all over town all day and you can do 10 to 18 tune-ups a day in one spot and take some of these guys and make them follow you around teach them how to clean systems unwire clean reinstall blowers start showing them how to use the tools, start showing them how to interpret the numbers. And you know what? After a summer of that, maybe next year, they'll be teaching the next guy. And build your own, have your own solution. Hope is not a strategy, but this is. Build your own farm team internally and pay them well because you expect a lot from them. And if they can't stand up to it, chew them up and spit them out and get another one. Yeah. I mean, really the recipe you have there that works within the context of the program is pretty much the whole reason your company exists in order to provide that implementation, the management, but this could all be done outside of a program. Yeah. You don't have to have a utility program behind it to do this. You could do it on your own, but one of the cool things that the utility program does for you is it brings some money to the table to help pay for the tune up for the customer, which decreases the cost that you have to charge for it. And if you don't have that money, then it's a very high-end tune-up. It's a very high-end service call. So you have to figure out how to make that work in your business. Now, we have a patchwork of utility service area in my state, which means almost every one of our trade allies has customer base outside of the service area of the utility that we're working for. So they'll have a co-op or a municipal utility that's a different than the one doing our program for it. They've figured out how to sell it to them like on their website, this tune-up, it, it describes it. It says, if you're an energy customer, it costs this. If you're not, it costs this. We'll do the same thing for you. We've had contractors go to commercial customers who have chain restaurants and do one of their restaurants and show them before and after photos and show them the performance numbers before and after. And they go, hey, would you be our maintenance contractor? I want this done at all of our stores. I don't care. We get the money from the utility for it or not. I want it done that way. I'll pay you. Just do it. If you see that vision and you realize that, you know what? In this world, are you willing to pay more for something that you know is right? That's the best that you can get? I think most of us say, yeah, we're not all driving Yugos and shopping at Walmart. And that's because we recognize that there's a difference in quality. And positioning yourself to do that, you may lose a little money on the first dozen or the first hundred. And if that's what's going to make up your mind, then do it, get out of the way, move on. But if you can see that that's an investment in your own personal skill set, the technicians, and making your customers understand the value of that, that's what allows you to charge a fair price for it, is making your customer understand the value. A lot of that's communication skills. You can teach people that technicians need communication skill crash courses sometimes. That's okay. 
and we can all learn a little bit there. But as far as let's talk about technician accountability, guys, a lot of times they get hired and they go, well, here's my resume. I've worked for this company and that company and this company. I've had guys come to my tune-up class for our program five years in a row, and each year they're working for a different contractor. I'm going like, okay, the merry-go-round is working pretty good for you, I guess. Huh? I can just imagine that in a lot of the situations they show up, they're hurting for another tech. You walk in, oh, you work for him and you work for him. Yeah, okay, here's your keys, there's your truck, go get him, Tiger. What do they know about that guy's real skill set? and his personal understanding of the science behind refrigeration and air conditioning. What do they know about the regimen that he's going to go through to troubleshoot? I think a lot of times they're so hungry for another helper, and you've been around the block, and you've been in the industry for a while, so here's your keys and here's your truck. Go get them, Tiger. And if you raise the bar, you say, you know what? I'm not going to just accept anybody to put that shirt on with my name on it and go out there and do God knows what tomorrow for my customer. I'm going to make sure that there's some accountability here. And using an approach like this, whether you have a program that's driving it or you want to drive it yourself in your shop, you say, we've got a bar. If you've got to get an attitude and you've got to get aptitude, we can get you there. But if you're going to come to work with a bad attitude, the wrong attitude or a negative attitude, and you don't have the aptitude to comprehend, you're not one of us. But if you've got those two things, I can teach you anything on earth. If you've got the understanding, the aptitude to understand, if you've got the attitude that, yes, I want to be good, I want to be the best I can be, I want to do my job right, and I'm interested in learning more about what's behind the curtain on all this stuff. The combination of really enforcing accountability, determining qualifications, determining competency, and the training program really go hand in hand. Because if you set up a training program, like you said, to make your own farm team, and you just have would have to take technicians, new ones, even if they came with experience, and run them through to see how they fare in your training program exams. I guess in a way it puts a lot of burden on the contractor, the smaller contractors to be able to do this, to be able to afford all that in-house learning. There must be some kind of critical mass you have to get to, you maybe 15 or 20 before you can afford to even have like the boss do the training, that kind of thing. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is I don't care if you're a two-man shop or a five-man shop or a 500-man shop. You can start with an experiment down this road and just put the people most likely to succeed in it. You know who they are already if they work for you. You know that maybe Bobby's a good fit, but maybe Sam is not. And you might need them both. You might need Sam to run in and just get stuff running. But you teach Sam to go, okay, ma'am, I got it cooling again. But you know what? I noticed some things here you could really benefit from that my company can deliver you. I'd like for one of our office personnel to explain that a little bit more to you and maybe book you another appointment in the future. But right now, I've got to go help somebody else get their air conditioner running. Would you be willing to have a conversation about that? That's all you have to teach Sam. And you keep him moving. And then turn around and take Bobby and make him the guy who comes behind and gets all of this other stuff working. I mean, to pristine condition. So there's a way. It's not like well, you can't do this. No, it's like, what do we need to do to do this? And then when you look at, okay, what if I can make the people who are the best fit for this, who are willing to learn and willing to spend the extra time and care about their level of performance and the customer's satisfaction and get them on board with it, then they're my champions. And if I get it working for those two guys, now let's add one more and let's add two more next year and go from there. You build a team, Drew. Something I know about you from your past, and it sort of relates to what we're doing here today, podcasting, you actually had a radio show at one time, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, for a little while, about 10 years every Saturday morning. Jeez, 10 years. Wow. <laughs> yeah. What was that? What did you talk about? Me and my partners decided that we were going to go into a home performance field in central Arkansas in 1994, 95. The reason I had the inkling that that was the thing to do was I had been working with Ron Hughes back in the early days of energy ratings when it was called energy rated homes before it morphed into ResNet. We were using blower doors. I was a card carrying, photo ID carrying, certified energy rater trained in the blower door in 1984. So wow. by 94, guess what? I'd gotten tired of telling people. Well, I found your problem, your ducts leak, your house sucks, and you don't have enough insulation, and your air conditioner needs some professional service, not the kind you've been getting. And they go, okay, but you just do the testing. Huh? You've done great analysis for us, but since you don't do the work, who should I call? Well, the more I learned, 
the shorter my list got until there was nobody left on it. And going to affordable comfort conferences, going to hear John Tooley from FSEC training down in Florida talking about how you diagnose the duck leakage and the whole house safety performance rolled into it, going to ResNet conferences. And I just, I kept learning more and like, I know what's wrong with all these houses. I know when their bills are high and their comfort's low and they're not getting what they need to get it fixed. And there's nobody to recommend to them. So I decided, let's go to market with this thing. Turned out, it was sort of different, and it was a brand new offering. The HVAC guys were just touching the box. They weren't even touching the ducts, let alone the house. The ducts weren't getting sealed. Nobody was doing house air sealing. Nobody ever heard of it. I guess they thought maybe weather stripping the door would take care of that. Blower doors came along. That changed that. Insulation was getting blown, but the prep wasn't getting done. The big holes around the can lights and the pull down stairs and the whole house fans were not getting addressed. You just blow it and go. So me and some buddies got together and decided to start our own business. Well, we needed to promote it in some way or other. So we started advertising on a local talk show radio station. After about six months of that, we told the people selling us the ads that, yeah, hey, we'd like to do our own show. Is that possible? And they were actually open to experimenting around with people who were experts in one topic or another and having a show. So we took the money we were spending on buying ads on other shows and just rolled it into buying our own one-hour show. It was about 42 minutes of actual talking time if you take out the news and the other ads. So me and my buddy got on. We started talking about home performance and some of the typical problems we see in houses and what the real problems are and what you got to do to fix them. And yet you don't have to accept that a room is just hot in the summer because it's got a lot of windows or it's the kitchen and we cook there. So it's going to be hot. So now there's a way to fix all that stuff. And of course, the answer to everything was, you need us to come and do our home energy audit for you. We'll figure out what's wrong with your house. But you can't just say that every time you have a call. So yeah, it kind of milked the top a little bit and asked a few questions. And people really got interested in it. And we built a pretty good listening base. So we did, it made the phone ring. And we started out doing the audits. And then the audits drove the improvements. And the improvements is where we made our money. So we come and maybe we'll do an audit for you and we'll give you a report. And your ducts are leaking 25%. That's relatively tight duct system in Arkansas because some of them leak 80%. And then your insulation is, it's okay over here, but not over there. And you got knee walls with nothing on them. So, you know, we recommend that. And we can reduce your house air leakage by 20%. I would do a manual J load calculation on their house as I found it and as I anticipated it being after we improved it. And I would cut their cooling load by 30% and their heating load demand by 50%. And I would show it to them in, in BTUs. I'd show it to them on bar graphs and they'd go, here's our sign. You sound like you know what you're talking about. Let's get going. And after you've walked them through the house with their house under pressure from a blower door or their ducts under pressure from a duct blaster and you've showed them and you've had them stand next to the fireplace and hold your hand out over here with that crack between the brick and the wood. Well, I got the blower door running at 50 pascals, and they're going like, well, hell, no wonder it's cold in the den, you know? (laughs) And they're believers. We did that business for about 12 years, and the radio show, that's the only promotional that we found that worked, that worked well, and it was worth the money. Direct mailing, phone calls, billboards, forget it. The radio show made the phone ring, and that made the bank account run. Did you just talk about a topic, or did you take calls? What was the format? Took calls. Took a lot of calls. It's crapshoot. You never know who's going to call. And think about this. A lot of contractors would be shaking in their boots. How would you like to go get on the radio live every Saturday morning and have any customer you've ever had in your life (laughs) be free to call you up in front of God and everybody and run you through the ringer or give you some kudos? How'd you like that? <laughs> that sets you up well to be a contractor trainer, I guess. But going back this around like 1994, you're saying we're 23 years down the road from that. How come you're not done yet? How come all the houses aren't fixed? <laughs> Why? What's going on? There's a few we hadn't gotten to yet. There'll always be some. And these programs are helping to get that addressed in our the local regional area. But when I was doing it, we didn't have any programs. We didn't even have a mandate from the Public Service Commission to do programs. What we proved was that the market, if they can hear about it and find out about it, they'll be the path to your door if you got a better mousetrap. So people were like, I've had homeowners call me up and say, hey, I'm so-and-so, and and you did some work for my neighbor, blah, blah, blah. I go, oh, yeah, I remember him. Yeah, yeah, we did some work for him. He says, well, I live behind him. And you know what? I'm sick and tired of him telling me over the fence of how low his electric bill is since y'all been there, and I want you to come and make mine lower than his. (laughs) I don't care what it costs or what you have to do, but I'm going to get the best of him next time. 
So that tells me that a lot of this is in the messaging and the marketing. And if the proof's in the pudding and you're doing a good job for people, they can feel the difference in their house. They can see the difference on their utility bill. They'll advertise for you. I cut one woman's electric bill was $420 winter and summer, cut it down to 57 bucks. Well, guess what? She was on my list of references for over 10 years. And I would call her each year and thank her and send her a gift card and go out and eat. And say, look, I appreciate what you've done. People call me and they've talked to you and they don't need anybody else to convince them. I said, you're selling more than I am. I don't want this to be a hassle for you. Would you like me to take you off the list? And she goes, no, you all really did a good job for me. And I appreciate it. And I, I enjoy talking to these people. And you can leave me on the list. <laughs> if you're doing things right, well, if you get about five or 10 of those. And especially more than that, and you can rotate them on and off that list. It works pretty well. And having people call us on the radio and do the same thing, compliment us. And it's obviously not rehearsed. It's all live. And that really influences people a lot. You also, you're a bit of a technician, contractor yourself. Like you say, you get your hands dirty. I know you just finished a project last year. Do you want to talk a little bit about that personal project? Well, Bill, I don't think finished is the correct verb there. Uh, <laughs> It'll never be done. <laughs> people ask me, hey, when's it going to be done? I was like, define done, right? <laughs> the moral of this story is be careful what you put on your bucket list, right? Because you just might wind up having to do it. I live next to a 250-year-old native pecan tree in Arkansas. It's pretty massive. It's been here since before the Declaration of Independence was written. It's 12 feet in circumference at about chest height. It's two, well, let's say probably 80, 90 feet tall and about 90 to 100 feet wide at the crown. What I'm finding is that when I was a kid, I lived next to the woods and I built tree houses and forts. And I played in the woods and had a blast doing it. And I've always, as a neighbor of this tree for the last 40 years, I've looked at it and said, man, one of these days, you know. <laughs> A few years ago, I was sitting in the yard recovering from some surgery, and I was looking at that tree, and it was kind of mocking me, saying, like, yeah, you ain't never going to do it. And I was like, yeah, we are. If I don't get started, I'm not going to get done. So I built a tree deck. People like to call it tree houses. It's kind of an all-inclusive term, but it's 25 feet off the ground. It's independently supported from the tree by cedar poles, local native cedar that are 16 inches in diameter at the bottom and 25 feet tall. I decked it with red cedar, which is beautiful, like your grandma's cedar chest. And I got stairs going all the way down. There's 42 steps, 7-inch rise, 12-inch run, all the way to the top. Handrails. It's my branch office, okay? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. When you're up there, it's just you, the tree, and the sky, the birds, the squirrels, God, and everybody. And it's just like, it's a hoot. And I worked my tail off on it for the last couple of years. I've had some help from some of my friends, but it's been a real cool project. And people look at it and they go, wow. It's a piece of art, Joe. Yeah, you're kind of right. <laughs> well, if you can give me permission, I'll put up some photos of it and we'll link to them. Is that okay? Sure. I'll send you a few. Okay. Send me a few photos. That'd be great. Joe's branch office. <laughs> Joe's branch office. Where's the branch work done from? We covered a lot of wide ranging topics here, focused around the utility program, some of the great work you've done through Clear Result. We'll kind of wrap things up now. We've been talking for about an hour. Don't want to burn everybody's time here, but I'm going to ask you uh, the hot seat question. You get a choice of one or two, either your favorite quote or something surprising or something people don't normally associate with you or know about you. I can think of an answer to the second one if you can't. <laughs> I've heard a lot of great quotes in my day and it'd be hard to pick the top one, I guess. So I'll go with the second question. And I guess one thing that a lot of people don't know about me is that I enjoy music a lot. I play piano, I play trumpet, and I play accordion. I used to play banjo, it's been a while, but most of the time I play trumpet and I have a local band I've played with. Back in the day, we played for five years continuously, professionally. Didn't make any money at it, so that's why I don't do it anymore, but it's still a whole lot of fun. Enjoy that. We had a reunion last summer, a 40-year reunion, and we had a sellout 300 seat house sell out six weeks in advance of the show had a lot of fun pulling the old crew together and playing we do everything from blues jazz uh, original tunes have a good time a lot of rhythm and blues and we had a six-piece horn section in that reunion concert and i love doing that and it's a release it's a lot of fun it's using the other side of my brain which 
it's it's great to do. That's kind of like the treehouse is too. That other part of all of us that most of us are some blend of both sides of the brain, technical, the analytical side, and then the artsy, fartsy side where you have fun and do what you like to do. Absolutely. I know a lot of technicians are musicians too. I they think it's a really interesting combination. That was what I was thinking of. If you hadn't have said that, I would have given you that cue. Since I play accordion and banjo, I'll have to pull this on you. Know, you do you know what the definition of perfect pitch is, Bill? No, I don't. Well, it's when you throw a banjo in a dumpster and it lands on an accordion. <laughs> yeah. And with that note. And on that note. <laughs> also, with your permission, if I can find a link to the Building Performance Band, I think there's a YouTube video out there. I might put that in the show notes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there could be some wild footage out there floating around that you might be able to find. All right. Well, we're going to wrap up here today, Joe. Really appreciate you spending time with me, and I look forward to seeing you out there uh, at some trade show or another in the next year here. It's 2018. Let's have a, make it a great year for everybody. Absolutely. I always enjoy seeing you, doing trainings with you, and just getting together and catching up on stuff. And it's a business doing pleasure with you, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Well, thanks for listening today. I hope you grabbed a little bit of information about utility-based energy savings programs and how they work along with side contractors and what contractors can stand to learn from them. If you want to keep up with other things that I find interesting, follow our page for this program on Facebook by typing Building HVAC Science into the Facebook search bar. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor of the Building HVAC Science podcast, please email me at bill underscore spone. That's bill underscore S-P-O-H-N at bluecollarroots.com. Some of the topics we discuss do require technical training for proper interpretation and safe execution. If you're a trained pro, then you can go right ahead. If you're not, please consult and hire a trained pro. If you're looking for some tools or test instruments that we mentioned in the podcast, take a look at what True Tech Tools has to offer. That's T-R-U-T-E-C-H-T-O-O-L-S.com. Use the code HVACBS for a nice discount. And full disclosure, I'm one of the co-owners of True Tech Tools. Thank you for listening and following us in the Building HVAC Science Podcast. If you do download this on an iOS device, please give us a review that will help us rise in the rankings and get other people informed and motivated, hopefully, to make some changes in the way they do things and better integrate building science and HVAC together. So I want to thank you for listening today. And please take a look at the show notes for some of the links and some of the information that Joe talked about in the show. Thanks again, and you all have a wonderful day. And before I forget, let's close with a quote. We talked today about how contractors can get involved, how they can change the way they're doing business, uh, how some of the technology implementations can really provide business opportunity for them and good service for their customers. So this quote I've chosen is by Pele, the soccer star. Quote is, success is no accident. It is hard work, perseverance, learning, studying, sacrifice, and most of all, love of what you're doing or learning to do. I think that embodies a lot of the HVAC and building performance, building science professionals that I've encountered. They really do have a love of what they're doing or learning to do. So with that note, go out and love what you're doing today and have a great day. Bye. Thank you.